Now, many of you might worry that the notion of well-being is truly undefined and seemingly perpetually open to be reconstrued. And so then how, therefore, can there be a, an objective uh, notion of well-being? Well, consider by analogy uh, the concept of physical health. I mean, the, the concept of physical health is undefined, as we just heard from Michael Spector. It, we, it has changed over the years. When, when this statue was carved, the, the average life expectancy was probably 30. It's now around 80 in the developed world. There may come a time when we meddle with our genomes in such a way that, that not being able to run a marathon at age 200 will be considered a profound disability. You know, people will send you donations when you're in that condition. <laughs> Notice that the, the fact that the concept of health is open, genuinely open for revision, does not make it vacuous. Okay, the, the, the distinction between a healthy person and a dead one is about as clear and consequential as any we make in science. Now, another thing to notice is there may be many peaks on the moral landscape. There may be equivalent ways to thrive. Okay, there may be equivalent ways to organize a human society so as to maximize human flourishing. Now, why wouldn't this undermine a, uh, an objective morality? Well, think of how we talk about food. I would never be tempted to argue to you that there must be one right food to eat. There's clearly a range of materials that constitute healthy food. But there, there's nevertheless a clear distinction between food and poison. Okay, the, the, the fact that there are many right answers to the question, what is food, does not, make, does, does not tempt us to say that there are no truths to be known about human nutrition. Now, many people worry that, that, that a universal mora morality would, would require moral precepts that, that admit of no exceptions. So for instance, if it's really wrong to lie, it must always be wrong to lie. And if, if you can find an exception, well then there's no such thing as moral truth. Now why would we think this? Consider, by analogy, the game of chess. Now if you're going to play good chess, a principle like don't lose your queen is very good to follow. Okay, but it clearly admits of exceptions. I mean, there are moments where losing your queen is a brilliant thing to do. There are moments where it's the only good thing you can do. And yet, the chess is a domain of perfect objectivity. The fact that there are exceptions here does not, does not change that at all. Now this brings us to the sorts of moves that people are apt to make in the moral sphere. Okay. Consider the great problem of women's bodies. What to do about them? Well, this is one thing you can do about them. You can cover them up. Now, it is the position, generally speaking, of our intellectual community that, well, we might not like this. We might think of this as wrong in Boston or Palo Alto. Who are we to say that the proud denizens of an ancient culture are wrong to force their wives and daughters to live in cloth bags? I mean, who are we to say even that they're wrong to beat them with lengths of steel cable or throw battery acid in their faces if they decline the privilege of being smothered in this way? Okay, well, who are we not to say this? Who are we to pretend that we know so little about human well-being that we have to be non-judgmental about a practice like this? I'm not talking about voluntary wearing of a veil. I mean, women should be able to wear whatever they want, as far as I'm concerned. But what does voluntary mean in a community where when a girl gets raped, her father's first impulse, rather often, is to murder her out of shame. Just let that fact detonate in your brain for a minute. Your daughter gets raped, and what you want to do is kill her. What, what are the chances that represents a peak of human flourishing? Now, to say this is not to say that we have got the, the, the perfect solution in our own society. I mean, for instance, this is what it's like to go to a newsstand almost anywhere in the civilized world. Now, granted, for many men, it may require a degree in philosophy to see something wrong with these images. <laughs> but if we are in a reflective mood, we can ask, is this the perfect expression of psychological balance with respect to variables like youth and beauty and women's bodies. I mean, is this the optimal environment in which to raise our children? 
Probably not. Okay, so, so perhaps there's some place on the spectrum between these two extremes that represents a place of, of, of better balance. Okay. But perhaps, perhaps there are many such places. I mean, again, given other changes in human culture, there may be many peaks on the moral landscape. But the thing to notice is that there will be many more ways not to be on a peak. Now, <clears throat> the irony from my perspective is that the only people who seem to generally agree with me and who think that there are right and wrong answers to moral questions are religious demagogues of one form or another. And of course, they think they have right answers to moral questions because they got these answers from a voice in a whirlwind. Okay, not because they made an intelligent analysis of the causes and condition of, of, of human and animal well-being. And in fact, the, the, the endurance of religion as a, as a lens through which most people view moral questions has separated most moral talk from real questions of human and animal suffering. This is why we spend our time talking about things like gay marriage and not about genocide or nuclear proliferation or poverty or any other hugely consequential issue. But the, the, the demagogues are right about one thing. We need a universal conception of human values. 